But that's a key place to be being present. And one of the biggest things I hear from people is this is so much work. Being present is so much work. You know, we're this society is all about autopilot, and that's where we're not being who we be. We're not making choices based on what's true for us because we're not even perceiving it. We're just doing what what we're supposed to do. We have to put dinner on the table for the kids. We're doing it because we have to do it because we have this job. We're not choosing it. We're doing it because I have to, uh, out of necessity. And so getting into a place of being really present with self and perceiving that kind of truth. And also I think being patient with, we have so many layers of limitation that we've taken on from oh so many ways, from culture and family and religions and school and professions and media and blah, 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 that, you know, it can be a practice of pulling all that off of us. And the place I see people fail is where they stop. They say it doesn't work. It does, it's taking too long, right? And any time people say it doesn't work, it's not it, it it it's taking too long. They end it right there. Uh, so it is about getting over those places of being willing to kind of step into what's it going to take for me to really perceive truth for me and choose it and be willing to choose it because truth for me is is not always going to fit in this reality. Being present, I think, is always the most important thing and the most loving thing anyone can do for anyone else. Within that loving thing, there's also a quality of detachment in that I don't own the outcome. If I'm, very, if I'm being present someone, with someone so they can make their shift, it's because it's also giving them space. We were meant... We were set up so that we could heal ourselves. But lots of things have happened in our lives. So to be present for someone else gives them the presence and the space so they can do that, that healing activity for themselves. The other thing is a level of dis detachment in that I can be very loving, but I don't own any of the outcomes. So I think the statistics are that a woman in abusive relationship, sometimes it takes seven times for her to leave before she makes it a permanent left. <laughs> okay. So I don't own the outcome. If I need to be present or if a person needs me to be present for them seven times or seven times seven, or seven times 70, whatever the number is. I would also encourage people to look at what they're eating and drinking because garbage in and garbage out. You fill yourself full of sugar and you, and I'm a, this is a, something I have to work on so I know. <laughs> you fill yourself full of sugar, you fill yourself full of TV shows or movies or newspapers that highly adrenalize you, you're going to be in a high adrenal situation and then you need high adrenal situations to keep going. It becomes a form of an addiction. So to pay attention to what goes into your mind, into your ears, into your body is very important. Um, as far as you being able to perceive yourself better. If you're in a highly adrenalized situation, if you're craving the wrong kind of foods that are not supporting your body, it's really hard to slow down and be present. On a personal level, I have found that a good way to be present for myself has been meditation and to be in group meditations was very important in my journey because you have the support of the whole group to develop that place where you're being present and quiet and listening or feeling or whatever. Those personal experiences have also been when I felt loved to my core 
or love to a cellular level. So then when my life did get off track, I could remember those feelings and remembering is re putting the mem parts, remembering, putting the parts of members back together. You can do that for yourself easier. Um, and it also becomes easier to be kind in doing that for others also then because there's a patient quality in there where you are totally aware of the environment, the surroundings, the other person, and where your heart is in charge instead of your brain. Um, religiosity is the uh, living out the dogma. Um, it would be the rules instead of the people. It would be the, um, in our global paradigm of religion, it would be the hierarchy and being on steps of a ladder and some being of more than others. Old paradigms weren't necessarily that way. There were a lot of paradigms that were more circular, but most of those are gone. Right now, we've got the ladder. Living in your own truth knowing who you are, being able to experience your own life as a important and divinely um, connected being. So I agree, religiosity is much of the dogma, most of the definitions, this is what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to be, the right, the good, the wrong. Uh, I think spirituality, the concept of spirituality was the next step where people were really perceiving religion was not really it, that it was a limit, creating a limitation. And people were looking to be connected to something different and began to coin the phrase being spiritual. My interesting point of view is that that's become its own dogmatic limitation in a lot of ways, that there's been, people have taken definition into it as well and created the definition of what it means to be spiritual, right? And uh, so I think it was the step in kind of expanding out and it's kind of taking on the definition of this reality again into a bit of a limitation. If you stand nowhere do you know if there's an up or a down or a right or a left religion is the platform we begin on it's the place that gives us our foundation to build religion is someone else's path to the awareness and the connectedness with the divine and in that beginning point we're all children that have to learn that there is a divine. There is a right way to be, a right way to be in society, a right way to be with ourselves, a right way to be with God, a right way to be with the universe. Religion, I feel, is a very good thing, but it's the platform from which we launch ourselves into the contrast and the comparison that this person is a Buddhist, this person is a Muslim, this person is a Jehovah's Witness. And we begin to see that there is more than what they do or how they label themselves, that there is a divine connectedness. And as we begin to explore that in ourselves, we begin to perceive the spiritual connectedness or the presence of spirit within our aliveness, that it is not just about doing, it's about being within and being without in the presence of that divinity, that it's not just out here, it's in here as well. So to me, spirituality is that connectedness with all that is and that sense of personal presence and religion is just the journey that begins you and then you take off from there. It's that platform. So can we define to someone who is unaware of that connectedness with the divine what that is like? Well, 
primarily I look at that a little different than maybe you perceive that I feel like every individual has felt that connection whether they're aware of it or not and therefore that if someone doesn't understand it it's because they're not relating to what I'm saying or to what someone else is saying and that it's just a moment of being present and having an active dialogue not a preaching not a, a teaching but just being present not to coach or lead a person but just opening and saying wow for me there is a moment of elation there's it's almost as if I feel the pulse of the universe I feel the magic in my veins and I feel so alive colors are so bright life is so sacred and I know that everything has a purpose and that it's all perfect it's all divine and in that moment of description often the other person will say no for me it is like this and through that sharing through that dialogue there it becomes a connectedness and so for me I, I feel like each one of us has that experience in some small way even as young children oh, let's see I don't know that uh, that I was always to define it as a heart space I like to create experiential activities for people to notice what's different here, what's different here, what's different here, um, until they find how they perceive their communion with everything. Um, I mean, for me, I don't experience it in my heart. I experience it when I'm ex in incredibly expanded. Um, I used to define it as an experience in my heart, but I have a completely different experience of that now, of just being, just connect in communion with everything, uh, in s simultaneously. Um, sometimes I can describe those experiences to people, and people will go say oh I've had something like that or I'll ask have you ever had an experience where the wor everything just opened up and you just knew everything and it just dropped into place it, you just felt like you everything made sense to you so sometimes when I describe it that way people will get it um, and sometimes I can create experiences with somebody that that kind of I can be that expansion I can be that communion and just by being in that space, some they can feel the resonance of it, and and feel the communion with it, and 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 then there's a re then there's a place they can recognize when they get into that place. I agree that children naturally have some of that, um, probably to a greater degree yes <laughs> probably to a greater degree than most of us realize or have and for some reason a lot of us don't remember much of that aspect and I'm assuming that has to do with our culture but I'm not for sure but I'll say that those who have feelings for others but don't but say they don't feel that I think it's because they don't remember those parts of their childhood or weren't acknowledged for those parts of their childhood where they felt that connection or had that affection or some empathy. Um, my, my firstborn grandson, he tells me things, uh, he told me things when he was two, two and a half, that the level of empathy, I was awed. I really think it's our culture that makes and breaks people and fragments them. I do believe that there are things in our environment that make it harder sometimes for some people because they're chemically changed in utero to make connections. And again, that's up to our culture to change. When I first started doing development classes in a structured setting, 
it was in a spiritualist church and there was a monk who was brought in to teach us and he wanted to get across the importance or lack of importance of being a psychic or a medium etc so he talked about the mother at home with lots of children at her feet and all the work she had to do and how the children would cry and pull on her dress and so she had to get back to her chores but she would hand them a toy and they would be happy with that toy and rejoice in that toy for a period of time until it wasn't enough and then they'd cry and pull on her skirts again and this would go he would enumerate uh, many times that this would happen until finally they would cry loud enough and hard enough that she would reach down pick them up and embrace them and that's what we all want those of us who go through psychic development that's what we're really looking for is them the embrace of God or goddess or I love the story because it made God a woman <laughs> but the truth is what we all long for is that love connection and that's all and that's kind of what we're all looking forward to going back to isn't it that bigger connection that doesn't feel the separation that we feel because we're in a body I guess the other point would be that I do believe that we can encourage that kind of kindness and connections with people in community and form better communities by those kinds of connections and feelings being talked about and promoted when we're children and that again we can make a better culture because I think all of that is in a lineage of sacredness and is part of our lineage of divinity I think all of that intersects and comes together and you can't do one without the other my name is Deborah Luttrell I'm a access consciousness uh, certified facilitator and from the access consciousness point of view we have access to anything we can perceive know be and receive anything that's available in any time space dimension and really the only thing that gets in the way of that is our point of view whether we can or where we can't and most often little kids see stuff all the time uh, or they'll call uh, beings in to be their imaginary play friends and then uh, they're told that they're not there or they hide them or they send them away so uh, because we begin to buy into the adults point of view that that's not possible we'll cut that point it will use that point of view to cut off our awareness and our capacity so in access uh, all the tools and processes in access are about uh, removing the limiting points of view so that we can get back to perceiving what we're capable of perceiving and stepping into the capacities that we really have the world as you know it I hate to disillusion you is not flat nope not flat at all the world that we live in is a multiverse and most of us have a tendency to live within our mind and we spend our time in our mind oh I guess thinking that things are a given way and we limit our perception of what is real we live in a world that is not only physical but it is spiritual and it is also connected in with other realities and we cannot really know about this until we get out of our thinking or our brain now living the extraordinary life is living a life where we do not feel the victim we do not feel that we are obligated we do not conform to what we are told but rather we live with integrity we live with respect for ourselves and all living beings Native Americans discovered this years ago that the true way to live is to live in harmony with all creation over the years I've studied with shamans all over the world and when I sit whether it's in a Kiva in Chile 
or in the mountains in Vancouver area of Canada, what I have found is they all say the same thing, is that we are part of a spiritual reality. We are spirits in drag, Mortis, to be honest. We are living beings that have taken on vehicles or forms, and from these forms we have wonderful experiences. But they are not just to think and to do, but to process and to evolve ourselves. So when I talk to the spirits, and I do this quite frequently, they tell me that we have come into this earth plane to evolve ourselves, that we are in a process of personal development, and that for every experience that we have, there is cause and effect, action and reaction. And in being in this situation, we allow ourselves to experience things, process them, and then come to new realizations. Thus, each time we have an experience, we transcend our previous reaction to it. So therefore, we become more action, interaction, bringing ourselves to results or realizations that transcend us. I feel it's also very important to integrate a little bit about what I said. Many times I brought up culture and um, those aspects of us that is more than just ourselves. We don't grow up by ourselves. We do very few things all by ourselves. And even if we're all by ourselves, inside of where we live. We are never not impacted by others around us or the things they do around us. We are at a time right now where that spiritual aspect of the community seems to me to be a very important topic. And certainly our choices of human values or our choices of other values that are not based on the human community are impacting all of us everywhere. I hope you will consider the choices you make and know that your spirituality is deeply connected to the choices you make and the things you do and re-evaluating those choices and the new choices you make and your actions based on those choices. So, I hope that you will look at the community of those around you. Seek for truth and justice and uphold the spirituality of the total community. Either everything is sacred or nothing is sacred. And how does that define our actions? And when we have to make choices that we don't really want to make, how can we make those choices within the sacredness of the community of humanity? Thank you. So I would love to talk about the subject of uh, interconnection with my own spirit and give you an idea of how you can do that for yourself. And one thing I have found when I'm explaining it to other people is that I always start with saying, have you ever done something that you knew wasn't quite right? And then recognize the feeling that you felt when you did that. And that really is source coming to you. For me, it's in my heart area. And I can actually, when I do something that I know is not quite right, I have a very uncomfortable feeling in my back as well behind my heart. But if you can find that place where you, um, and how you felt it, that when you did whatever it was you did that wasn't quite right, recognize that and know that that is your spirit 
telling you that this isn't right. Your spirit is speaking to you. And when you learn to be able to find that place in your body that resonates when you make decisions, very soon it becomes intuition. And then that allows you to be able to take your journey and listen to Source and be directed by Source or Spirit. We all have different names for that. And it allows you to take this amazing journey through your physical life where you don't have to worry about anything, really, truly. There's nothing to worry about. You can just walk this path, look for the voice of Spirit, the touch of Spirit within your own body, and follow that. And remember, the most important thing is that sometimes it seems that you're being told to do something that isn't quite right, but it's not, in that case, it's not about the journey, it's about the ending. And Source will never take you down a path that you don't have to be. Source will never do that. Spirit is always with you and loving you. So remember and recognize that place in your body when you're um, going th through a trial or tribulation or perhaps a very good time and, and understand that and acknowledge it and let it become one with you and enjoy that journey. Thank you.